morning. Uh, my name is Boris Astergev, and uh, I work for Smartcom Bulgaria, the R&D department. And today I'm going to present you our uh, control plane software, which is a customized version of FreeBSD. Well, a few words about the company. Uh, Smartcom Bulgaria has been in the scene since 1991 and we have approximately 100 employees at present. Uh, we're split into three main departments, integration, microelectronics, and research and development. The integration, well, my colleagues there do deploy uh, certain appliances for different projects, uh, mainly Juniper, Infinera, uh, audio codes, etc. and uh, microelectronics stuff. Uh, well, they uh, create or actually invent techniques for making chips, mainly MEMS related. And uh, the R&D department, uh, this is where, uh, where I am, where well, we are about 15 people and we uh, try to create uh, actually network appliances for uh, uh, different, uh, for different uh, ISPs so that uh, we can give them the ability to deliver uh, the triple play service uh, to their clients. Obviously, data, uh, voice, and uh, video. So, how did it start? In the middle of 2007, we had uh, actually this picture here in Bulgaria. This is how ISPs delivered uh, uh, well uh, their services. And obviously, uh, as you may presume, uh, uh, from time to time, there were uh, no services at all due to the uh, weather conditions and due to the uh, obviously uh, uh, bad infrastructure. So we had to tackle this issue and uh, hence our first manageable switch. It has a protection against lightnings and we have certified that. <laughs> and uh, uh, it is called Smart Switch Pro 800, uh, a Motorola CPU based on Realtek, it has eight uh, 100 max Ethernet copper ports, and it's managed via uh, a GUI. So we wanted... To oh. Hmm. So we wanted to push things further. Okay, everything's okay. And uh, here's our next family of switches called SGS V1. Oh, come on. Sorry? Yes, I have. Okay. Hmm? Good day. Low battery. Low battery, sorry. So, it doesn't work, I think, right now. So, but uh, you basically can hear me. So, I'll continue. And stream, well, that's a pity. Uh, so, uh, uh, this is uh, how we wanted to push uh, uh, things further. Uh, hence, we created our uh, second um, family of switches called SGS-V1. They were ARM9 uh, uh, with uh, ARM9 CPU based on Marvell chipsets and they either had uh, they either have uh, 24 or 8 uh, 100 max Ethernet code for ports or uh, two 1 gig ports. They were Linux based and uh, uh, actually, the main focus was such that we uh, can uh, they were able to deliver a triple play service. But in the middle of 2010, we had plenty of issues uh, actually finding uh, components and parts for manufacturing these switches. And uh, can we disable it?
So in the meanwhile, uh, we had a new... That's bad. Well, I disabled it, but obviously the problem is there, in my opinion. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the new uh, requirement was such that, uh, uh, or actually, whether we could create a layer 3 hardware switch, obviously a router. And uh, we started contacting uh, several vendors, uh, for instance, Broadcom, uh, MediaTek, uh, formerly Relink, I think. Uh, 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 Realtek uh, as well, and Marvell, and well, only Marvell gave us a chance. We uh, opened, uh, actually, uh, we have signed an NDA so that uh, uh, they could handle us uh, their documentation, and they proposed us two system on chips. Uh, obviously, the great thing about them was uh, that uh, this is how we could address the customer's requirements. We could redesign HGSV1. And the great thing uh, to me, in my opinion, was such that uh, they, had, uh, they actually have identical registers so that we could deploy a single system and just uh, trim some of the features and actually have two different switches. So, so the new appliances, HGSR, layer 3 distribution switch, and HGSV2, uh, an access switch substituting HGSV1. They were all, well, the, the switches for mentioned, uh, they were all designed from the ground up in SmartCom Bulgaria, both hardware and software. So a few words about HGSR's hardware. It is a Marvell system on chip, uh, ARMv5 CPU with a single core, one, uh, actually 800 megahertz clock speed, 512 um, uh, megabytes of memory and 512 uh, USB flash disk. Uh, it has a modular architecture, uh, hot swap architecture, 24 1 gig ports and up to four 10 gig ports. Uh, so the uh, a few words about the layer two features and layer three features as well. Well, we have we support up to 16,000 MAC addresses in hardware. Uh, we support jumbo frames, VLANs, obviously stacking. Layer 3, uh, there are 30,000 uh, TCAM entries for routing, 4,000 of which are uh, for, uh, for ARPs. Uh, we obviously support ACL-based routing and uh, ACLs. Uh, uh, QoS, IP multicast, storm controls, and what's more. Uh, a few words about HGSV2's hardware. Well. Uh, it is. Uh, uh, it, it actually has uh, a similar uh, system on chip in it. Uh, we put a little less memory there, 128. Uh, and uh, a few words about the interfaces: 24 multi-speed SPRJ45 ports, and uh, four combo uh, one gig combo ports. Uh, so this is actually a trim version of uh, the SGSR here. So uh, uh, this is the brand name, uh, uh, the tone for SGSR. Here, here is the uh, here's the SGSR uh, ROS. The, that would be ROS and uh, our CPE. Uh, again, the, the main focus was such that we deliver uh, the ability to our customers so that they can deliver the triple place service to their customers. And <laughs> So, enough with the introduction. Uh, the software choice, why, uh, we choose actually FreeBSD. Why? Of course, due to the uh, BSD license, it's more commercial friendly. And, uh, well, uh, the Marvell system on chips, well, they had support at that time uh, in the 8th branch, and this is what we use. And uh, obviously, it's not that easy to jump to a newer version, but I will uh, say a few words about it later. We were very inspired by NetGraph at that time. And uh, to me, without starting a flame war here, well, uh, FreeBSD has the biggest BSD community, and uh, this is great. So uh, NetBSD had support for our chips as well, but uh, well, they uh, lacked uh, NetGraph in the main line. And uh, this was an argument to us. Uh, OpenBSD did not support our chips, so the argument uh, actually in the decision was quite political and uh, we had to start immediately so that we can address the deadline. 
which was a couple of months, so we ended up finally with seven or six months. I think, well, but I'll skip that. I'll not uh, step any further. So, where do we start from? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, to be honest, in terms of chronology, well, uh, uh, hardware and software, well, uh, they uh, went in parallel. It's not just, okay, here's the hardware. Uh, uh, the, the, the guys in uh, the hardware team uh, had to actually design it uh, and so forth. So we ordered a demonstration board so that we can start uh, from somewhere with our software, obviously. And uh, now this, uh, we'll take uh, that uh, we have the hardware for granted. So we use U-Boot uh, so that we can initialize the, uh, it initially. Uh, we use its API so that uh, we can connect it to the FreeBSD loader. Uh, uh, so the main idea is so that uh, uh, we can export to the FreeBSD loader uh, the uh, callback so that we can read from our USB disk, hence we can read uh, our kernel. And uh, you use the UB loader for that, great project. Uh, uh, now that we uh, could read, uh, actually, uh, the kernel, uh, we started reading images, but obviously they were uh, actually borked. Why? Because uh, we had to tweak a little, uh, a little bit the API, and uh, hence I wrote a uh, simple uh, feature in the loader so that I can uh, actually uh, calculate the checksum of the image that uh, I have read, and. Uh, to be sure that I have read it without erroneous bits, so that uh, on booting uh, uh, I would not experience uh, any, uh, let's say, uh, crashes and uh, hangs. So let's boot the kernel and say a few words about its design. First of all, let's split it between hardware and software. Here we have the Marvel uh, Mac and uh, uh, all of its uh, properties and features uh, and uh, ports, obviously physical ports. In kernel space, uh, we have a CPU port uh, that r represents, and uh, th this is the place where we receive uh, the intercepted packets. Well, in control plane, we need to intercept packets so that we can uh, actually uh, use uh, some pieces of information of them so that we can configure uh, features of the hardware. Then we have written a Hardware library, well, obviously, uh, we were given such a library, but uh, the license was not quite uh, good. And we had to, uh, to write it uh, our own. So it's a kernel object, uh, basically with tons of interfaces in it uh, and uh, methods. So that, uh, its main idea is such that uh, we can control and tweak the features of the hardware here. Uh, then, well, we have 28 physical ports. Uh, uh, well, have it in mind uh, like uh, 28 uh, Ethernet cards. And now we wanted to create a, a logical representation in kernel for that, and that would be uh, this part here. Uh, so we uh, actually uh, created 28 uh, ports uh, that, that can easily uh, be viewed uh, by, for instance, typing uh, ifconfig. And this is our objects that uh, actually uh, represent uh, the, the physical part that is uh, down there. So, uh, in user space, we use plenty of uh, user land daemons, tools, facilities, etc. They, they communicate with the kernel, of course, through various interfaces. Uh, I did split ifconfig on purpose because this was our initial idea, so that uh, th this was the, the main uh, configuration facility where we had to start from something. We obviously couldn't, uh, well, say, okay, uh, here's the CLI. We, in the beginning, we uh, didn't have a CLI. So uh, uh, the ifconfig facility was, uh, its main idea was such that we could control basic uh, features of uh, the hardware. So, the network stack. This is our proposal to the network stack. Well, we uh, have plenty of ports, as I said. They can be either member of uh, of an aggregations or uh, 
uh, they can uh, actually be assigned uh, a uh, VLAN trunk, obviously here the unit. Uh, each unit represent, uh, represents a single VLAN uh, for that port. And, uh, uh, well, uh, they, they have plenty of properties. For instance, PVIDs, uh, this is generic here, and some of them inherit actually uh, properties of uh, the uh, interface that is below them. So, for instance, uh, let's say that I want to bridge uh, two uh, interfaces, for, uh, for instance, a port and a VLAN, in uh, one and the same bridge, actually. So uh, sometimes in control plane, you have to do that. You have to some, uh, somehow unite them. Hence, here's the, the bridge part. It has, obviously, again, the property of a VLAN. And it has to be the same with uh, its uh, unit members. Then, uh, we have an interface called interface. Not uh, quite a wise name, but uh, never mind. It serves as a demultiplexer for different families. Uh, for instance, uh, on top of it, it has a sub-interface here. Uh, each sub-interface, for instance, carry a, a, a property of a family, IPv4, IPv6, MPLS, etc. This is the main idea. And uh, here's the router part. It operates on these uh, layer 3, uh, actually, interfaces. I must admit that uh, we were very inspired by NetGraph for this whole infrastructure. And, uh, well, uh, we actually ended up creating our own uh, uh, infrastructure so that uh, we can actually manage uh, the, the features of the switch. So uh, I'll give you an example here uh, about the, a single uh, relation here. Let's say I have uh, a port uh, IF net if, uh, structure. It has a, uh, a pointer. Uh, a if VLAN trunk here that is null, which means basically that we I don't have uh, a unit on top of it. Well, the SGS if lag here uh, it's uh, another pointer and it points to a soft C of an aggregation, and uh, this is how we uh, connect. Uh, uh, this is how we actually say that. Uh, uh, well, uh, there is an aggregation on top of us, and that this port is actually a member of a uh, aggregation. Then, in order to uh, well, we know. Uh, I think that you know the if input pointer here. Well, it is usually assigned the ether input function, and this uh, quite busy function. And uh, we wanted to skip that so that we can gain certain amount of opti optimization. And uh, uh, we actually assign uh, a callback procedure from uh, the module that's on top of us. For in, in our case here, the uh, lag module assigns a uh, input procedure for uh, uh, its uh, parent one. So, as I said, we gained a certain amount of optimization, but uh, I can't give you uh, performance results, which is bad. So, uh, how do we traverse actually the network stack here? Well, basically, we received an interrupt here, we fetch the frame, then we end up in the uh, uh, CPU syst uh, actually call uh, with the MBUF. Now, uh, now we know the uh, source port, the source physical port, and the source VLAN, so we can send it to our uh, module here. Then uh, we check the glues, actually. And uh, if they are non-null, we can pass further. And this is how we actually uh, traverse it. Instead of calling other input that, that's quite busy, that we'll uh, check all of these uh, uh, glues uh, in the same time. The aggressor, well, sooner or later, the other output function, the if transmit park, where we are hand off a uh, uh, and in the if start, we are in queued with a uh, MBUF. Then we, in our uh, if start procedure, in uh, in our module, we uh, dequeue it and uh, hand it to our CPU uh, port module. Uh, and its job is to uh, actually compile the frame so that it can aggress the device. So, a few words about the Unicast router. 
Well, there are initial obstacles regarding the hardware here. I mean, the TCAM updates, well, they're quite tricky from time to time. You must sustain there the longest prefix match so that uh, it is completely consistent with the FreeBSD uh, forwarding table. And, uh, uh, well, sometimes you, uh, in order to write an entry there, you may need to fetch a certain block, populate your entry there, and then uh, you must write the whole block. If you don't do that, it will, uh, you will end up uh, with inconsistencies, and uh, this actually will result in, uh, let's say, software routing, which is bad for a uh, uh, 800 MHz uh, CPU. So, uh, how do we actually populate our uh, hardware? Well, uh, we need to intercept traffic uh, f for uh, some time. I mean, we need to trigger ARPs. When uh, two directly connected hosts want to uh, view each other from different ports and in different VLANs, why not? They, uh, uh, we need to uh, actually eavesdrop uh, this uh, uh, communication uh, with uh, the ARPs. So we have placed a hook in, uh, in ARP uh, input. Uh, well, uh, in order to actually intercept traffic, uh, we need uh, to uh, actually uh, intervene with the routing messages system uh, so that we can update network prefixes in the TCAM so that it uh, sooner or later will give us uh, uh, some of uh, the traffic so that we can uh, actually con uh, control the TCAM. And uh, we have placed a hook into RT dispatch so that uh, uh, when uh, there is a bundle of routing messages, we can immediately ah uh, go and uh, populate the, the, the TCAM. The multicast router. Well, we use uh, FreeBSD's implementation options and routing. To me, it kind of works uh, well in our application. Uh, we need, again, to intercept multicast data traffic in CPU so that uh, we actually know the source uh, 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 source uh, IPs of certain multicast streams. And uh, this is how we trigger MFC updates and upcalls to us so that we, uh, we can populate the cache there. We have placed hooks here and here, and uh, this, is how, uh, this is how we can try the TCAM activity, uh, the, this function. Uh, well, the hardware uh, gives us this ability, uh, and we need it because uh, from time to time when we are, for instance, a first router, and uh, a, rose, a rendezvous point, well, we are ob obviously flooded with uh, tons of multicast streams. And we, OK, uh, we intercept traffic for a second. And then we insert, the, for instance, a drop rule so that, uh, we, uh, and track the, the TCAM activity so that we can sustain the cache there. Uh, well, the MFC up calls are handled by uh, a daemon in uh, user space. And uh, its main job is to actually populate the cache uh, in kernel. A few words about useful tools and implementation. Well, we, we use plenty of facilities here. BPF for intercepting packets uh, in, raw, in raw mode. Callouts for repetitive action. Event handlers for syncing uh, different proper, uh, properties synchronously. IOCTLs, kernel object locks for making things atomic. Uh, well, sockets, syscontrol, syscalls, etc. And in user space, we have, uh, in the beginning, uh, used uh, lots of uh, awk and set operations, CRON, ifconfig, route, sh. And, uh, well, uh, we, have, uh, we uh, wrote actually a tool that is able to read uh, certain, uh, well, to read all of the registers of the hardware so that we can track down bugs and misconfigured features. Then, a few words about the layer two features. Actually, there, uh, I've tried to generalize them here in, uh, in terms of control plane. Well, first part, they're mainly interface property related. Uh, I will enumerate some. VLAN tagging, Kunku, auto-learning, link transitions, dampening, static MAC addresses. They, they look very different. Uh, but in the same time, they are just properties of uh, certain objects uh, in our network stack. 
And uh, the main idea is, uh, the simple idea is, okay, we, we want to create a VLAN. We issue an I, uh, IOCTL, uh, create a VLAN, and it creates an object that represents the, the, the physical the physical part, then we, uh, the VLAN interface is responsible for uh, contacting our hardware library so that we can program the controller. <sighs> okay, another example. We want to intercept IGMP packets. Good. Then say it to the VLAN and uh, its job is to contact again the library and this is how we will interpret IGMP packets uh, in control plane. Uh, actually intercept. Uh, the, the second category, packet interception oriented, LACP, uh, RSTP, IGMP snooping, where we have to process certain group memberships, DHCP snooping, where we need to track certain states, insert option 82. Uh, and, obli uh, and obviously, a uh, great feature here, uh, 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 we are able to insert an allow rule uh, in the ACL, so that only DHCP authorized uh, persons may have internet access. Uh, well, another example. Now that I can intercept IGMP packets, I can create a daemon, IGMP D. Its main idea is to intercept uh, IGMP packets for uh, slot 3, port 1, VLAN 10. This uh, actually I'll say pair and then as soon as I uh, receive certain uh, membership requests I can uh, issue an ISTL so that I can program the hardware so that it will duplicate uh, traffic instead of uh, doing it in software. The other three features again mainly packet interception oriented, unicast routing, interview on multicast routing, policy based routing, uh, well uh, SMP we can easily use BSNMPD uh, and take it for granted, PIM, sparse mode, BGPD, we can use open BGPD, we can use Quagga as well. Uh, of course, it's a little bit tricky because we had to tweak it uh, with the routing messages and uh, our infrastructure. Uh, DHCP relay, obviously layer, uh, layer 3 feature, I, I will not step any further. And uh, another example here, I have, I have a PIM daemon. Uh, I set some options so that I can add uh, a bundle of interfaces in IPM route. Then I uh, program the hardware through the library. I intercept PIM and IGMP packets and multicast frames. And for the configured interfaces, sooner or later, I, uh, IP input will be called so that uh, it will end up in uh, MFC cache mesh, um, uh, miss. Uh, up calls and th this is how we will populate the uh, the cache. Uh, an example here about non-packet interception oriented uh, features. Well, routing preferences, FreeBSD wouldn't give us uh, uh, a forwarding table that is aware of routing preferences, and uh, we obviously had to write a daemon so that it can uh, it could handle. Uh, different, uh, uh, actually identical routes with different preferences and uh, uh, choose the, uh, the appropriate one. So, the quality of service. We have plenty of uh, rate limiters, storm controls, uh, queues per egress, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, but in terms of control plane, uh, we had to make our CPU such that uh, we uh, uh, could split the management traffic uh, and the intercepted traffic in different queues uh, because uh, for, uh, if we don't do that we may end up with uh, actually uh, the case uh, that uh, we would be unable to actually manage our switch and which uh, and this is bad then uh, now that we have packed all uh, of this stuff uh, how uh, do we upgrade it? How do we uh, hand it to our customers? Well, uh, we use a modified version of NanoBSD. Uh, to me, a uh, great project. It uh, gives redundancy. We uh, made it to have four slices. That we use UFS for that. Uh, we have two root, far, uh, root uh, file systems. Uh, well, uh, one of uh, the two root file systems are uh, is active, 
uh, we have a config slice for holding configurations and we have a miscellaneous slice for uh, testing purposes, for instance. Well, uh, uh, mm, the, uh, sometimes it's not quite uh, actually uh, good to upgrade a whole uh, nano BSD image and uh, hence, uh, because it's slow. And uh, well, it will not uh, actually spoil the service, but uh, it's slow and sometimes it's not necessary. So I've ported the port collection to our needs uh, so that uh, it's a pretty customized one and it is uh, so that it is focused on partial upgrades and uh, uh, it may cross build certain facilities of our software. Uh, well, uh, Obviously, there will be little, uh, little or uh, no service disruption. Well, we we upgrade the kernel, uh, we will have service disruption. But uh, if I want to update a certain tool that is able to read uh, certain uh, certain uh, counters, and uh, I uh, tend to uh, update uh, its source uh, quite uh, frequently. Well, uh, maybe handing a s uh, single package to the, cus uh, to the customer uh, is uh, obviously the uh, right uh, approach here. So, as I said, it's convenient for partial upgrades. Now, a few words about uh, the CLI. Well, nowadays we have a CLI. It's based on Clish and it's a uh, Cisco-like uh, CLI. It's hierarchical. We use Lua and, and Shell scripting uh, uh, in it and uh, we use SQLite 3. Uh, the, the interesting here is that uh, it's commit oriented instead of enter and shoot as uh, the Juniper uh, COI uh, as the Juniper's uh, approach. And now it's the desired way for configuring the device instead of just uh, issuing IF config uh, shell scripts and uh, etc. etc. A few words about the developing issues. Well, the ARM debugging in both in kernel space and user space. Uh, well, uh, in kernel space, we may uh, use a JTAG and we can trace the kernel uh, at some point. Uh, but in user space, it's uh, quite hard in the eighth branch. So uh, we have to, to cope with that. We, of course, obviously do crash inspections. We use classic dumps to a swap partition or we use net dump. Great project. Uh, well, back traces and traces uh, are hard as well. But to me, the toughest part is uh, that sometimes I have to import certain patches and new stuff from FreeBSD, and that's hard because uh, the eight branch is lagging behind uh, nine and ten. Uh, so the toughest part is that uh, it's hard that we track latest versions of FreeBSD. A few words about the, the quality assurance for all this stuff. Well, of course, we do uh, plenty of black box testing and the uh, well uh, equivalence partitioning boundary value analysis stre we stress test our uh, uh, software uh, exploratory test uh, interoperability, uh, interoperability tests with uh, Juniper and Cisco force 10 extremes uh, of course testing in real topology and we automate that hence we have regression tests uh, through the CLI and through the SNMP protocol and we use TCL for that a few words about the future development here. Obviously, we have to work on IPv6, and we support now only IPv4, but uh, I think it's quite okay for now. Uh, well, uh, we uh, maybe need to focus on uh, supporting VRFs. The hardware uh, uh, gives uh, us uh, this ability, but we have to uh, enhance the software. Well, stacking, maybe it's a good idea to make the switch, uh, or actually a bundle of switches act as a single one, and, uh, uh, well, so that they can easily be configured via a single COI. Well, of course, we have to optimize the code, redesign, re-implement all those bloated parts. I think I end here. So, thank you. I, I may, uh, may I, uh, do I have time? Uh, yes. Hmm. I'll use some demonstration here. Oops. 
So here, here you are plenty of actually interfaces. Okay, we have port 3.1, which, which is a 10 gig port. It is a member of an aggregation. Here is our CLI. Plenty of uh, configurations here. We have lots of VLANs. Well, what else? I think that uh, currently there is a, a TV connected to this switch, so I will check its uh, the, uh, memberships. Well, I have this group now, and it is delivered to a listener in VLAN 599. I think that's Sky Sports HD. I don't know. Uh, well, I'll stop here. The, 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 there's plenty of more uh, demo uh, demonstration I can make, but I will leave some time for questions. Do you understand right that a large part of the traffic flows uh, in the hardware without entering the FreeBSD kernel? Yes. Uh, but can you monitor it uh, in the runtime, the, the amount of traffic, the packets? Yes, I can. I can. Okay. Take. I can actually uh, run a TCP dump on our CPU port and I can easily uh, view the number of packets per second, for instance. And TCP dump, yes? Start to enter the no, 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 no. It, it will only show you uh, the traffic that is to be intercepted. I mean, the traffic that uh, is designated to the control plane. The hardware traffic, no. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, the hardware router, will, uh, or for instance, uh, the layer 2 switching, will not end up in the CPU. Uh, of course, but mm -hmm. if you run uh, You will only see the, <laughs> con uh, the control plane traffic. Of course. Well, here. Here it is. I have plenty of counters. They are exported via the SNMP protocol. We can uh, plot uh, tons of uh, MRTG and uh, RD2 okay. uh, stuff there. And uh, we can clear that. Oh, there is time. They start ticking again. Can you give me the dead microphone that my voice won't go through? I will pretend to speak into the microphone. Um, so, two questions. One is, are the chips you're using still supported under FreeBSD 10 or only under 8? I, I think that they are supported in 10. Okay, so there's no reason you can't go to 10 other than the fact you have legacy code. Well, there is a reason. Which is? Uh, the, the reason is such that, uh, well, we have tested the 8 branch uh, extensively. And uh, we haven't encountered uh, crashes uh, and uh, certain uh, stuff there. If we jump to another branch, uh, we must test it again extensively so that we uh, discover, uh, undiscover the bugs uh, there. Okay, so it's a testing It's kind issue. of risky. We, we may uh, focus on doing that. Uh, uh, well, we may need to make our uh, actually software as a module so that uh, it, it is detached from FreeBSD to some amount. But uh, it's kind of tricky. Okay. And the hardware library, is there a well-defined API? Uh, or is it just DMA commands to control the hardware? Uh, oh, well, uh, uh, we use the uh, kernel object infrastructure where we create an M file, a, a M file, and uh, there you uh, create, uh, actually describe the methods. 
and uh, this is uh, what we use. Okay. And is any part of this committable back to FreeBSD? So, well, uh, I have uh, given uh, some, well, let's say, uh, parts or uh, bugs, but, uh, uh, well, n not, the, not the whole, the whole stuff. Simple. Not the whole thing, yes. Somebody else? Anybody? Well, let's thank our speaker then. <laughs>